So I'm going to start. Dr. Lucy Loomis is going to be our first speaker. And Dr. Loomis is the Director of Family Medicine at Denver Health. And then we're going to run over here to Dr. Simon Hambidge, who's the Director of General Pediatrics at Denver Health. And he's going to talk about his clinic. And then we'll do Dr. Holly Patel, who's the Director of General Internal Medicine. And then we'll end with Dr. Ray Astacio, who is the Director of Quality Improvement and Research and also an internist. So Lucy, take it away. All right, I hope, <coughs> hope you guys can all hear me. So one of the other hats that I wear at um, Denver Health, in addition to uh, the Director of Family Medicine, is over the, the past uh, several years being the clinical champion for developing our patient center medical home uh, initiative and application. And so I was really excited when um, we started to talk about CMMI and how it was designed to build on and optimize uh, PCMH and, as Paul said, it was what led us to do uh, PCMH on steroids. So um, anybody who's gone through the process, especially if you're working on NCQA 2011, no, there are a lot of things in there that aren't easy to do um, in terms of transforming your practices. So I think uh, perhaps I went into this a year ago thinking that this grant would um, make it uh, a lot easier for us to get the recognition. And uh, unfortunately, um, I cannot uh, really say that is the case because basically it's hard work uh, to transform a practice, no matter, no matter um, uh, what resources you have, because you really have to get people to change how they think about providing care. Uh, and when you've been doing something for many years and all of your systems are geared to deliver that product, it's still going to be difficult to change. So um, what I wanted to talk about is a little bit how we've tried to integrate the two, uh, the two projects over the last year, the one project being how are we uh, uh, planning for our, our next round of PCMH change and then the um, um, and, and CMMI, and I've, I've, I actually um, I've sent Deb a, a somewhat random uh, selection of notes, which you guys now all have, uh, and uh, um, I included on here um, uh, a number of the different concepts and standards that we've been working with, and so if we were part of the Safety Net Medical Home Initiative, um, and I listed the, the eight change concepts that they talk about. And people who are doing PCMH work have not taken advantage of the resources they provided it's through Quality Health, and I put the, um, the link on there. They have a, a bunch of really good um, documents that help work you through um, some of the change concepts for doing PCMH. I've also listed the 2011 um, standards and the, the features of um, CMMI. Um, what um, and as well as where the top, um, the, the six types of waste in healthcare that have been identified. And, you know, you'll just see there's a lot of uh, commonality across those. Um, but what we did, um, we started, uh, we do an annual process where we look at um, uh, what, what projects we want to work on in the next year and, and how to, to plan for them. So as we went into that with PCMH, we, you know, we looked at what we were doing, where our gaps were for the 2011 standards. And then um, we integrated the CMMI project by inviting people that were working on that. And actually, really, it's uh, most of the same people. It's just sometimes we go to meetings wearing one hat, and then we wear another hat, another meeting. And after a while, you can't remember what you talked about at what meeting. So, um, But we, we went together and we said, well, here, here are the you know, five things we need to do this year. And what are the things that are really going to be built into the medical home, and what are the things that we can use the, the CMMI resources for? <clears throat> so briefly, uh, what I try to list here is sort of some of the things that were really slam dunks and have worked really well, and other things that we've continued to struggle with. So um, one really obvious one was the whole transitions of care. And we do have a lot easier than many places because we just have to deal with one hospital for the most part, and that's Denver Health, and we all share the same system, so it makes it way easier to identify which patients have been discharged. But it doesn't always mean that you identify them in a timely fashion, and, and you still have to have a way to link them back into uh, primary care. So we worked together with the CMMI team to develop uh, innovation where we would have navigators who uh, work with the uh, uh, the discharge teams to identify people being discharged and then help navigate them back um, into the primary care setting. Um, and that was really a, a clear one that met 
the goals of both of the projects. Um, we also have used the funding to be able to increase the amount of behavioral health integration in our clinics. And that's uh, been very helpful and very well received by, um, by the clinicians. And then um, in the last few months we started using, as we've been able to get more sophisticated tiering data, it's really taken us about a year to get to the point where we can give the tiering data back to the clinic. So when uh, one of our PCPs is seeing a patient, they can in real time see what tier that patient's in. Um, and then, but then they're like, well now I know what tier they're in. And now what do I do with them? They, some of them say, we're going to just, I want to send them all to the high-risk clinic, but the high-risk clinic doesn't have room for them all, and we still have to manage them. So that's where we've been working on developing uh, some different ways of looking at case conferences and bringing in um, teams that in the medical home and from the CNMI grant to, to see what are uh, our ways we can uh, intervene with those patients. And that's really something we're just beginning to, to work on. Um, I think where we struggled a lot more is in some of the practice-based interventions and this whole, while, while the concept of saying that you've got different levels of services based on their tiers seems, uh, seems really nice when you look at it um, with the, uh, the inverted triangles, in, in reality it's much harder because um, there's sort of, all the primary care doctors think their patient, is the, no matter what their tier is, is, is a hard patient or, or has a lot of need, and so there's this great desire on all, everyone's part to pull the uh, extra resources, the navigators or the, um, uh, the pharmacists and have them help you take care of your patient. And then the patients move back and forth between tiers as well. Um, so we, but the other thing we have, we wanted to do is have it really be clean that if, and recognize that when patients do move between tiers, how do you have a good handoff so you're not like redoing all the work? You did everything for the tier four patient and now they're got better in their tier three, but you want to be able to build on what's been done before and not have to then go back into a whole new care plan and, um, and the like. So those are, um, um, are some of the things that we have struggled on really de devising a clean way to um, in implement some of those in our practices. And one of the breakthroughs I think we've had in the last few months is um, I don't know how many of you are, how many of you guys are working on PCMH 2011 standards, or probably some of you guys have already done it. Uh, but one of the things you have to do is select a, a patient populations to focus on, which are the three clinically important conditions, and then uh, a way to identify and manage high risk groups. So that's sort of where we've linked the two together. Where you've said that we're using the tiering algorithms to identify the high risk pediatric and um, adult patients, and then those folks will get um, access to additional resources. But we're still using the PCMH framework to uh, build access to those resources. So uh, if we have a process where we uh, are doing self-management goals for all of our patients, for um, for a tier two, one or two patient, it might be the primary care physician or somebody else on the primary key team working with that. But for the tier three or four patient, it would be the navigator or um, a case uh, case manager that's working that would do that. So we're um, so we, we have the handout, but that's still sort of the handouts. It's still sort of a work um, a work in progress. Um, and then we also identified there was a number of PCMH standards that really have almost nothing to do with CMMI and are entirely about how you redo your practices. And a couple of examples of that are improving uh, lab tracking specialty referral tracking can sort of overlap a little bit um, and um, uh, access to health care for example that's really more something you do in the in the practice so so that's just a quick overview of how we've tried to uh, separate those and and uh, integrate the two programs at the practice so I um, jotted down some ideas to uh, to share we were banned from PowerPoint so. um, <laughs> We were told to keep it informal. Um, so I thought I'd start with my main points, uh, like Lucy did, um, Deborah, asked us to summarize some main points which you have in your handout. So I think it's very important, uh, especially for those of you caring for kids or caring for both kids and adults, to use risk stratification tools that are valid in both children and adults. And that sounds obvious, but um, there was one reason we went to the CRG. CRGs have been used in adult and pediatric patients actually for a long time. I actually first used them in a research project in the late 90s. Um, so they've been well studied 
Um, and you know, they still have every tool has some issues, but, but CRGs are a good tool for both populations. Um, secondly, and, and Tracy and Paul both spoke to this, but tiering of patients by medical complexity and utilization, that combination, it permits you to allocate your healthcare resources rationally um, and to try and allocate them to the highest risk patients. And I'll speak more about how I think it's important to have both of those going into the mix. So for, for us in particular in PEDS, um, a combination of a registry use, so we had two registries, uh, mainly for kids' special health care needs and asthma that we used. Asthma is pretty straightforward to identify. Kids with special health care needs, we actually put a fair amount of work into over the last five years, identifying conditions um, that you know qualify for that registry. And so those were ready to be used when we started this project. Initially, we just started off using those, and then we overlaid the CRGs on top of that, and, and basically found it was like um, a little bit like two overlapping Venn diagrams, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I think they both have strengths and some limitations. Um, a big challenge for us, and I think it's a little more true for peds and for adults in our population, is obtaining data from outside EDs and hospitals. A lot more of our kids go to outside facilities, especially from the east side of town where they're closer to Children's Hospital. Um, so about 50% of our urgent care use, for instance, is outside of our system. Um, we, as of yet, you know, a little over a year into this grant, have still not been successful in getting data from outside of our system. So that put that limits what we can do with CRGs. And we know we'll have a kid who's highly complex. We know it's costing our managed care group a lot of money, and yet none of that's in our hospital. So it's, that's something we're working on this year to really get the full picture. Um, so that's something where the RCO could potentially be a big help also. Um, and then finally, um, a big cost, a big driver of pediatric cost is uh, NICU stays, obviously. And currently, any intervention that can improve, you know, improve interconception care, prenatal care, can potentially save money. We actually don't yet have um, interventions designed around that. There are some other um, innovation grants around the country at pediatric sites where they are um, targeting um, prenatal care more explicitly. It's something I think we'd like to work on this year, but it's something to think about because we won't be talking about it much, and it is a big driver of cost in the pediatric population. Um, so we talked a little bit about using both um, sort of medical expertise within your practice registries and then the CRGs together. Um, no matter how smart you are, how well you know your patients, there's still going to be patients that are costing you practice money that you can't identify medically, and that's why the CRGs are important. Conversely, the CRGs are good, but there's, so I'll give you a couple of examples of, of what would have happened if we'd just been using CRGs. So we've, we've actually gone in and, and you know, taken it, we'll, we'll go in and take a deep dive at, okay, which kids are in which CRG category, and then go into the subcategories. and. So some things that came out of that, for instance, we had a group of kids that were costing, um, that were being tiered highly based on their <coughs> billing codes, not on their actual utilization, like CRGs. It all had hepatitis B. And we're like, wait a minute, we, we don't have a lot of kids with hepatitis B in our population, especially infants. Well, the, the vaccine was actually being recognized by the CRG software as, as the disease. So you could see how that works. So, so, so without, without clinical review of CRG data, you can so, so that's why it's so important to have, have the combination. Um, <clears throat> the, just to give you an idea, for kids, the tiers, we feel pretty good about how they are right now, even though we don't yet have all of our outside um, utilization data. Um, and just to give you an example, our population of about 50 or 60,000 kids um, you know, for over 45,000 of those are in tier one, which makes sense, right? Most kids are healthy, and so they're getting um, automated reminders and maybe some text reminders about different health, flu vaccine, well child care, and that. Otherwise, there's no additional resources. Um, the, the second tier of kids, um, there's a couple thousand, I want to say. Tracy, correct me if I'm too far off here, but 
um, these are kids with, with stable, uh, you know, maybe mild asthma, for instance. Um, tier three, we're starting to get into, into more complex kids. Kids with uh, moderate or severe persistent asthma, uh, maybe seizure disorder. Um, the second tier, we added patient navigators. The third tier, then, nurse care coordinators, to where you really need some medical assessment available by phone, in person. Uh, and then the fourth tier, which is only numbers about 400 kids, are our medically complex special needs kids. Um, and for that, we, as, as Tracy mentioned, we have a, a special needs clinic um, that is really, um, there's a lot of neat things going on. And so I just, since we're supposed to be sharing practices, I thought I'd just um, share a couple of those with you, a couple of examples of interventions. So, <clears throat> for both our special needs and our asthma kids, there's about, we're approaching, I think, now 20 specific pediatric interventions on this grant. Um, one that really resonates, I think, with people when they see it is our transitions out of the hospital, and this was modeled somewhat on what the adults are doing. But, you know, kids with Down syndrome, for instance, end up hospitalized 10 times more than kids without Down syndrome. And a proportion of those hospitalizations are potentially avoidable. Some of them are not, but, but you know, potentially avoidable. Um, kids with asthma obviously have a higher hospitalization rate. So, and one of the most vulnerable times for admission is right after an admission. You go home, you don't do so well, you end up back in the hospital. So, um, we have our navigators actually going into the hospital. They'll, they'll get automatically pinged when, when there's a kid admitted with asthma, for instance. They're actually going in and meeting the family, at least Monday through Friday, we don't have them working weekends yet. Uh, meeting the family in the hospital and then working with them on that transition out of the hospital. Um, so we don't have any outcomes data yet. I can't tell you if it's working or not, but it's sure making the families and the providers happy. I can tell you that, um, just, just from right now. Um, we were, <coughs> we actually met today with um, the nurse call line people who, you know, they serve as Denver Health, but they also serve all of Colorado Medicaid, I think, and, and a lot of other groups. And, you know, obviously a, a family with a kid with special needs in the middle of the night, if a G2 comes out or something, they can call the line currently, but the call line has no way of knowing their special needs kid. They're actually, because of some bizarre HIPAA thing, which will, will be overcome in the next few months, they can't access, even if they're a Denver Health patient, they can't access our own records on the kid. There's this wall that's been put up. Um, but um, they have no way of identifying that kid, and if the mom isn't, or dad is not good at describing what's going on, you know, they're probably going to end up in the emergency room. So, what we meant today to talk about was um, specifically how they can identify if it's one of our tier four kids, which instantly should raise a red flag, how, how we can provide backup for them if they need it, and also how to get any additional protocols or training above Bart Schmidt's general peace protocols. That, they could potentially use. So that's a, potentially a service that will impact anyone who uses the call center, not just um, uh, Denver Health. So, um, so we're very excited about that. That was that was just today. Um, the uh, I'm think of some other good examples of interventions. There really some some. Uh, oh, the, just a little bit about the special needs clinic. Obviously, we have multiple clinics. Our three big pediatric clinics see. Um, about 90% of our, our special needs population. We based that clinic at our campus pediatric clinic because there's resources there around the hospital. But actually, there are as many kids with special needs at our west side and east side practices combined as there are on campus. And so they've actually started taking, we're trying to have that clinic function not as a medical home, but as a consultation service. So it's not to disrupt any existing medical home. And uh, they've actually started taking that clinic on the road um, to uh, the other pediatric clinics, um, which has been hugely popular um, with with families and providers again at those sites, so they don't have to go travel, you know, further to get to I the hospital. I call that a little bit of a cold, so I'll try not to sneeze and cough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> with a line. <laughs> 
Um, so I'm Holly Patel, I'm the Director of General Internal Medicine, and I'm going to talk about a couple of things that we're doing on the adult side. It's important to note that we take care of adult patients, um, both in our general internal medicine clinics and in the family medicine clinics um, that, that Lucy runs as well. And so they're, they're sort of spread out over a large number of clinics, and so trying to figure out some of this is the same sort of challenges that Simon has with pediatrics. Um, a couple of comments about tiering. I think for adults, really what we were trying to do, which is not dissimilar from pediatrics, was at first I think we thought about it as we wanted all the very complicated, uh, most expensive patients in the top tier. But then I think we really had to change a little bit and think about the patients that are complicated and expensive, but that potentially have modifiable expense and disease that can be better managed. Because we know that there's some people that are there because of catastrophic illness or things that you probably can't change, costs of care like HIV medications, that sort of thing. Whereas there's other patients that perhaps aren't following up doing the things that maybe could help them, don't have the connection that we can impact. And so that really, I think, was a little bit of a shift in thinking for us because we wanted you know, the most expensive, most complicated patients to be at the top and the easiest patients to be at the bottom. And so, you know, as we, especially as we got things back to the providers, I think they were a little bit confused at first about sort of how that played out. So I think we're starting to learn a lot about how we take care of patients by, by being a little bit more thoughtful about that and doing that. Um, and part of that is we still have patients, I think, that are in those top tiers that we're still not really sure what interventions we're gonna do. And I think the big example that comes up in adults are the patients that um, tend to have a lot of problems with alcohol and go to the emergency room a lot, don't, don't uh, manage their heart failure very well, their hypertension very well, and that we're still having a difficult time engaging those patients. And there's a lot of contacts for us to make from the navigators or the intensive teams to try to engage patients um, in that situation. And we're still not as successful as we'd like to be. So we are keeping some patients in those high tiers that we feel like we can't impact yet, but we feel like we could impact when we can figure out how to you know, what, what we could do and what resources we might have. Um, the two things that, um, and then I think the other thing about tiering is it really helped us move away from interventions that are disease-based, which don't work very well in a lot of our adults, to interventions that are more patient-based. Because we were really, prior to this, we were doing a great job with a lot of our quality metrics, but we were working on diabetics and hypertensives and lipid control and cancer screening, and it was the same patient being touched by five different people. And some patients are, are kind of okay with that, can hang with that. A lot of patients sort of find that a little disjointed and who's calling me and who are you and I don't trust you now and please stop calling me, which is probably, to be frank, the way I would be if eight different people called me. Um, particularly if you're about to you lose your minutes on your cricket phone or whatever. So, so you know, I think it really helped us to focus more on the interactions of these diseases and all these things collectively versus looking at just one or the other. And that's why we backed away from looking at, oh, your hemoglobin A1C is greater than a certain number, so you're automatically tier three, to looking at how those all things all played together in the CRGs. Um, so two things that we did um, just to help care for the adult patients. Um, one was we set up um, what we call the IOC, which is an intensive outpatient clinic. And that's really our hotspot or clinic, if, if you think about it. Because of the resources of the grant and because of the size of our system, we were able to do that. Um, it's a clinic that um, more, is more highly resourced to take care of those patients. So we have a substance abuse counselor, um, you know, a navigator, a social worker, physician, nurse practitioner, a lot of, a lot of time there. And really for the providers that have been working there, at least for the general internal medicine providers that have been there so far, it's really about practicing medicine the way they really wanted to practice medicine, which is not trying to figure out you know, when somebody's refills do or some of the social things, having other people that can help them with that and really being able to focus on the medical issues. At the same time, however, having all that input so that they don't just write eight prescriptions and call it a day, but they understand from the other people involved in caring for that patient how those things are going to impact and so then make more negotiations about what really is the priorities and thing. And I think that's the hard thing sometimes is really being able to prioritize. Um, and um, the way that we identify patients for that is that they're tier four patients, but they also have to meet a utilization criteria. And because of the way our system's integrated, we can generate a daily list of patients that just had their third hospitalization. And then our staff can outreach to the patient right there while they're in the hospital. Um, that makes big difference in those patients following up in primary care. It also can be a little tricky because sometimes people aren't at the right time to, to sort of think about those things, especially early on in their hospitalization. So sometimes there has to be a number of visits throughout a hospitalization. Um, but, but the intensive outpatient clinic has really been modeled um, after some other clinics in the country and after some other work that we've done, the HIV clinic that we have in the geriatric clinic, um, which I think helped us, is helping us to be more successful because it's something we're already a little familiar with and know how to do. 
Um, we have a number, number of challenges that we haven't addressed yet, one of which is um, how we're gonna transition patients out. So, you know, I think that there'll be some patients that'll need to get their care in this sort of setting for a long time, similar to mental health, but then hopefully there'll be other patients that should become stabilized and go back to primary care. And um, the patients that engage in the clinic really like it. They get a lot of personalized attention, a lot of people calling them and helping them and doing things for them. And so we envision that it might be difficult for them to go back to usual primary care where there isn't somebody always at the end of the phone quite so easily. So we haven't negotiated, we haven't been in the position that we've had to negotiate that yet. We only have about 100 and I think 25 patients in that clinic right now. Um, so that I think will be a challenge for us to figure out how best to do that. And we have had a number of patients that really like the thought of the services but don't want to change their primary care provider or home. And so I think similar to what Simon's doing with the pediatrics, we'll have to figure out is there a way we can do some services to those patients in a way that helps those teams. And we haven't kind of gotten to that point yet. The other thing that I was asked to talk a little bit about are the case conferences that we've just started doing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the case conferences are a way that um, we've tried to use the data to push to the primary care providers, those patients that we think are at the highest risk, and um, and then ask them to do interdisciplinary conferences. And, and we sort of have a number of different models going on right now at some of our clinics. Um, and really, it's a way for our providers to have knowledge about those patients that might have fallen off their radar, or that they might just not really be aware of what's going on, and to pick out some of those patients and talk about those patients with the social, the social worker, the navigator, the behavioral health consultant, the clinical pharmacist, depending on what that team resources have, and try to figure out a plan where everybody can take part in taking care of that patient. Um, and those have been very well received. The first clinic that started doing them is just like, well, go try this, see what you think. Kind of came back to us and said, we're like, well, should we continue this? Did it really work? We're like, oh, we're gonna keep doing this, regardless of what you all say. We're doing it over lunch, nobody cares. We all wanna have this opportunity to talk about our patients and participate. Um, in the care and really I think the providers a lot of them could quickly look and know you know who might they might need to pay more attention to and who really just had a catastrophic illness that might need some help but that isn't really you know is maybe sort of already gone is already on their way down their trajectory um, and again we don't have good data yet you know of, of either of those things to know that if they're really going to impact things the way that we are but certainly they're well received by the patients and the staff because they let people really talk about um, the patients and figure out the best way to care for them in a team-based approach, which I think has been something that some of us weren't trained in, um, but we're all learning how to do how to do now. Um, and then I was gonna let Ray talk about the other parts, but I can chime in. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'm, I'm Ray Astasio. I'm actually uh, helped lead the, our elementary QI uh, uh, for the focus on clinical uh, uh, conditions uh, for our uh, amateur units for pediatrics, family medicine, and internal medicine. Uh, and so Deb asked us to see, uh, explain or uh, uh, summarize some of the things that uh, the new CMMI grant or this 21st century care, how it impacted uh, our care of our population. So I won't go into super detail because I think Lucy for family medicine, Simon for pediatrics, and Holly for um, Internal medicine uh, kind of outlines some of the uh, proceed, uh, interventions that we've been able to do, but just to, uh, just to give a little background, we've had our uh, a standing uh, elementary QI committee for a long time before CMMI. Uh, it was had it was uh, started up I think by my boss uh, Dr. Milankovic, and so I get to take his position in this. Uh, so I have to report to him about our clinical indicators, but uh, the clinic. Clinical indicators we work on uh, as an amateur QI committee uh, are centered around our, our uh, Bureau of Primary Health indicators. So, so they're like diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, looking at hypertension, lipids, immunizations, uh, 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 <coughs> which, um, well child visits, um, cancer screening. And um, it's an interesting group. It's a fun group, actually. I, I, I rather enjoy it a lot, and that's why I took the position, because I've done research in the past. But I get to work with uh, this committee, and within each committee, we have a work group for each clinical condition. So like Holly was saying earlier, we've had to shift a little bit of our focus, because our, our, our separate work groups were focused on a, sp a specific clinical condition. Like we have a diabetes work group that's been uh, pretty robust in terms of focusing on the uh, uh, diabetes care at Denver Health. Um, we have an immunization group that Simon leads because that's his expertise, especially in research 
same, same with pediatric prevention. We have a, a work group uh, that uh, looks at cancer screening, which Lucy leads in terms of breast, uh, cervical cancer, uh, and uh, uh, breast cancer, and we're looking at other potential things to move forward with or not move forward, like lung cancer screen with CT scans, which I will not bring up. Uh, so uh, all those things, uh, all these groups, it, it's, they're a multidisciplinary group. David, our managed care, is like in every single group. We have about 11 or 12 more groups. So he, he, and he, he's not shy about telling us his opinion in terms of how we should run it. So, <laughs> he's an intern. He's an intern. Uh, but uh, these work groups uh, uh, are multidisciplinary, and we they're responsible for creating indicators that we follow. So, for diabetes, we pick um, uh, glycemic control, blood pressure control, and lipid control. Cardiovascular disease, we looked at also blood pressure for the whole population. Lipid management, coronary artery disease, antithrombotics for people with ischemic vascular disease. Again, it's kind of centered around our viewer health grants and uh, help uh, with some of the managed heatest indicators to, to throw in there to make our lives a little bit more complicated. But the, the work group's uh, function is to look at the evidence, maybe uh, create, because there's clinicians in these groups, and there's also subspecialists, create some potential interventions that would impact these indicators these work groups want to follow. So then comes CMMI. So we're doing great. Our, our indicators are all proximal, so they're all intermediate indicators. So it's, it's lipid control. It's aspirin use. It's glycemic control. It's uh, uh, cancer screening. So uh, when CMI comes in, we, we have this priority now to save money. And how do we save money by, as Tracy would say, treating somebody's blood pressure from 145 to 138? Well, that's a, me as a primary care physician, uh, my heart said that I did research in, in hypertension. So that's a long-term uh, goal for a primary care physician. But <laughs> we have to think about utilization, especially in this health economy. So uh, we have all these work groups, um, and, and we're blessed, although we don't have a real EHR, we do, we're robust in terms of our data uh, for these indicators. And we, we have a, a data, a hypertension re registry, a diabetes registry. We follow a lot of the, the cancer screen for a lot of our patients. Uh, and so we were able to create a dashboard or a flowchart, which is really, I think, a key component. I think all of you would agree in terms of being transparent in your, your performance. We can look at it at the organization level. We can compare it to other community health uh, practices. Uh, and that, that's good for Paul. Then, then uh, we could go down to the clinic level. And so each of the DOS is uh, uh, Holly with his internal medicine, uh, Simon with Pete's, and Lucy with family medicines can say, hey, this clinic's doing much better than that clinic. What's going on in that clinic? So uh, it gives it to that transparency. And at the clinic level, uh, the team leaders can then get it at the provider, uh, uh, provider, provi provider level and can compare providers. And then the team leads at that can actually pick on a provider. Because, you know, all physicians are pretty competitive, right? And that's why we're here. So everybody doesn't want to be in the bottom. You want to be at least the middle or the top. So, uh, uh, um, so, so th that's one of the things I think that helped with our QI process. One is uh, really believable data, and number two is the transparency amongst our uh, our colleagues and our, our uh, clinics and even different organizations. So when I look back in terms of how CMI affected us, you have to look back in terms of before CMI. Before CMI, a lot of our interventions that were created by these work groups uh, occurred at the point of care, at the clinic level. So a lot of it, we, we leverage a lot of our uh, 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 health information technology to create these registries and, and to pop up uh, reminders for our medical assistants. And we call them uh, uh, healthcare healthcare partners, sorry, space there for a second. So, so when they, somebody checks in right away, a, a, a healthcare partner or medical assistant will n know that Mrs. Jones hasn't been up to date with her cervical cancer screening, or Mr. Smith, it's been like a year since you got your hemoglobin A1C. So there's, they're kind of reminders at, at the point of care to the providers uh, to follow up on some of those things, but also created standard processes which would go ahead and facilitate an immunization or 
uh, set them up for uh, cancer screening either with a fit test or set, in, set them up for uh, a mammogram, so things like that. And it's up to the provider to say no to that. So it, it created that process. And I think that bumped up our quality indicators uh, in that regard. <clears throat> and so we've been lucky with that. So we had that. And then also before CMMI, we also started looking at population management. We use patient navigators, not to the degree that we use them now, to outreach to, to our registry patients. So if you're a diabetic that hasn't been in for three months and your last hemoglobin A1C was 10, that, that PN, uh, patient navigator is going to give you a call and say, hey, Mr. Smith, you know, it's been a while since you've been here. Your sugar doesn't look like it was that great last time you were here. You need to come in, get, get that recheck, and see if Dr. Uh, Batal can change your medications to see if uh, uh, improve that parameter. Uh, so we went from uh, point of care to outreach population management. And then CMI came in. So, so we're, I was so happy with our indicators in terms of what we were following. But like Ali said, well, blood pressure, blood pressure. It's, you know, it's, uh, 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 that's not going to affect the bottom line for, uh, for these patients. And so we had a shift in terms of changing our focus into uh, the higher risk population. Uh, David's, David and I are, are part of the cardiovascular disease group. And I, I told Paul, so Paul, we're about 75% in our hypertension compliance in our whole population. We've got 18,000 uh, patients with hypertension. He said, if we, if we really want to focus and make a difference uh, for our uh, for our population, especially for the high risk, high utilizers, and Dave always tells me this every time we meet that we got to focus on those guys. It may not, it may adversely impact our overall blood pressure control. So he gave me that raised eyebrow and said, "Oh, I don't know about that." But, but again, it's 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 a shift of mentality in terms of what we're doing. It's not a blood pressure number. It's not a hemoglobin A1C number, it's not a, a lipid number, but it's taking the patient as a whole and trying to shift our resources so we can address those higher risk patients, allow those at higher risk and more, uh, probably have a poorer quality of life to give them more resources so they cannot, so they don't have to go to the ED so often or be hospitalized. So we, we've changed uh, uh, our approach a little bit in terms of our focus and uh, 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 our higher risk patients. So uh, some of our indicators may take a little hit with regard uh, to that person with a blood pressure of 144. Uh, you know, he's going to be still counted in the denominator and won't be counted in the numerator as being controlled. So he's not uh, 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 improving our blood pressure control, but his risk is not as high. And so I, I think. I think this is uh, the right way to approach a, a population with the right metrics. Now, with um, uh, Tracy on board, we're hopefully able to more uh, accurately uh, track some of the harder outcomes, the utilization outcomes that we're all kind of worried about as a uh, uh, as a healthcare uh, collaborative here. And so, uh, still, we, we're still obviously fo uh, focusing on those intermediate outcomes. But we know down the road that um, now we'll get some more uh, real outcomes in terms of hospitalization and utilization. So uh, we've created a lot of interventions now that are, are, are uh, focused on that. Holly mentioned a, a case conference. I, I, we, I just had my case conference with my patients yesterday. It's, it's, it's great. It's, you realize how much you don't know and what kind of resources are out there for your patients. So, because um, uh, what happens, it, it's in a room, you get, you present three patients or four patients who are high utilizers created by Tracy's List, tier, tier three or tier four, uh, and you sit in a room with uh, uh, your medical assistant, your uh, a nurse, a behavioral health a specialist, a social worker. Social workers are key, by the way. So, uh, especially for our population and the other physicians in your group. So, you talk about it openly and, and um, problem shoot in terms of what that patient uh, needs might be and what potential solutions that you might have for that patient. So, you leave the conference with some action plans and some follow up for that specific patient. Uh, so, I, so I, I, it's a, it's a, we don't have outcomes yet, uh, so I'm, that's something to look forward to. I'm kind of excited about it, but at the same time, it's, it's, a, it's a hard, hard process. We've been over it a little bit of a year. It, it took a while to get our, 
uh, our uh, uh, processes in place, uh, defining roles and responsibilities was our biggest uh, issues. Uh, but I think we're probably getting the hang of it and how to utilize the resources we get for this grant. So I'll end with that.